Cool. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I was previously a systems engineer at Cloudera, so I have a pretty good understanding of the big data ecosystem. I got to play with all the tools that they offer and support. Uh, I have a pre uh, I'm actually uh, a Spark enthusiast since I work at this uh, tiny startup called Databricks. Uh, I'm a solutions architect there, so I help piece together uh, different parts of the ecosystem, understand the different APIs, help customers understand how to bring their applications to the big data world with uh, Spark. And that's all ranges and all industries. So who is Databricks? You guys probably know a little bit about us. Uh, we created Apache for machine learning, Impala, Hive for SQL. There's also Presto for SQL. And there's also another one called Spark SQL. Uh, instead of having to learn all these APIs, configure a bunch of infrastructure, try to build one platform. We also offer a product at Databricks, which is a managed Spark service. Try to remove a lot of the infrastructure overhead configuration and add some nice functions and features on top of Apache Spark. So it's kind of a platform as a service, as you would uh, imagine. So a bit of an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. A uh, little bit of architectural decisions when you're trying to build out a streaming application what the difference is between uh, Spark streaming and structured streaming. I think since structured streaming is quite new, a lot of people still don't understand what the differences between the two are, and also help you understand what choices you can make today with its current state. And then a few support issues that people run into when trying to start uh, their own streaming application. OK, so some design decisions. A lot of people have a, uh, a use case where they want to ingest streaming data. And what that typically means is they have a message queue that they want to read from. RabbitMQ is a popular one. Uh, the two that I've focused here were, are the ones that are most popular, Kafka and Kinesis. Uh, they're about the same. Kinesis is a managed service on AWS, so you no longer have to worry about machines, partitions, and hard drives. Kafka is a uh, tool that was created at LinkedIn. Confluent is a uh, very popular organization that helps influence that project, and they have a booth downstairs. And so you're going to throw records into these systems, and you want to stream them out uh, using an application like Spark Streaming. And Spark Streaming is doing the processing. You can do aggregates. You can enrich the data with some cold data. You can uh, filter out improper records, filter out and uh, throw those records to the sync systems, which would be S3, databases, dashboards, or uh, even to another Spark streaming application. So this is what the typical pipeline looks like. Uh, you have your uh, source, the streaming engine to do the processing, and then a sync. Another thing that I think about is uh, a lot of people want to keep state. Now, how do you keep state in Spark streaming? There's a few APIs to do that. Uh, you can manually kind of manage that. And there's two APIs called map state by key and track state by key. Uh, th that allows you to keep those aggregates in memory. So say you had uh, user clicks coming in through a website. You want to track how many clicks there are per user. And you want to keep that in memory. That's going to get stored in your Spark cluster. So if you had an organization and the number of users kept growing, you would see that you need to increase your Spark cluster just to keep that those uh, are aggregates in memory. Uh, there's another way to do it as well. Have another system that you want to keep those uh, records or aggregates in so that you don't have to grow or couple the storage of those aggregates with your streaming application. That's where you can use HBase, Cassandra, or some other key value store to put these. Right? Those systems are designed for pinpoint updates and lookups. Uh, they integrate with Spark Streaming today. There's libraries and connectors to do it. And there's actually blog posts of organizations doing it today. So f this allows you to uh, decouple the memory usage and keep just the processing engine a little simpler uh, so that you can actually develop a lot faster and uh, it's easier to maintain. Now, you have a few streaming uh, options when you want to use uh, Spark Streaming. The normal DStreams uh, API, that's what's available today. That's what a lot of organizations use. Uh, that's been uh, available early on, but with 1.5 and going forward, uh, it's the RDD-based API. So 
If you've heard a lot about data frames and data sets, these new APIs, DStreams actually works with RDDs. It's a RDD-based API. Uh, it supports Kafka, Kinesis, RabbitMQ. There's a lot of connectors for them. Uh, it's what a lot of organizations use today. Structured streaming, on the other hand, kind of uh, goes away from the RDD-based APIs. With the data frames APIs, they've added sources and syncs, and they're trying to help simplify the streaming workloads. And so you can uh, watch a few of the talks or look at the beta documentation upstream. Uh, writing a streaming workload with the new structured streaming APIs is much simpler. And they're going to handle aggregates, compactions, and a lot of other cool features that you would have to manually do and craft in the DStreams API. So it's supposed to be a simpler API, but it has limited sources and sync support today. There's no Kafka, no Kinesis support yet in structured streaming. Uh, it's more built for uh, having continuous applications with simpler APIs. So if you're making a decision today, you need to use some systems like Kafka, Kinesis, RabbitMQ. Uh, you don't have those uh, built-in uh, connectors available for structured streaming yet. They're to come this year. So we're going to dive into a few of these stack traces and what these problems mean, kind of understand what the root cause is, how you get around them, uh, kind of get you guys familiar with how to debug a few of these errors. I think uh, th this is what a lot of people run into and, and how we can get around them. So the first issue we're going to see is this uh, type mismatch. So a lot of these stack traces would occur when you're trying to start your streaming application. Uh, you can see that there's this object client library is not a member of package, which typically means we're missing something in the class path of your Spark cluster. And then there's this type mismatch. Uh, for some reason, it says it's, f it's found this RDD, and it has a byte of arrays, and it's actually requiring this other RDD. And the actual error here is that we have the incorrect libraries in use. And that's the main issue here is the top of the stack trace, where it says we can't find this member of this package. And so one of the APIs that we need is the Kinesis client library. And so I'm th this particular example was streaming records from Kinesis. Uh, we need the Kinesis connector. It's not just built into Spark. There's another library we need to add. But then also need the Kinesis jar, this client jar to tell us where the initial offset is. Uh, you can find out which region your Kinesis stream is in. And there's some other nice things that you could want uh, within your application that you're running. So making sure that you're using the correct libraries, there's no library uh, mismatches and dependency mismatches in your platform is uh, a key thing that you should watch out for. The second type of issue that some organizations have run into is this nice stack trace, where it says that you cannot find the leader offsets for this set of Kafka records. And so if you look, it doesn't tell you why, it just says we can't find it. Initial guesses are that the Kafka cluster or, uh, is down. There may be no connectivity. Right? You start thinking, what's, what's wrong here? When you dig into the code, though, you can actually see that there is a problem with the connector that they're using. So their DevOps team decided that they wanted to upgrade to the latest and greatest. They upgraded their Kafka cluster to Kafka.8, or no, to Kafka.10. But with Spark, they were running Spark 2.0 with a .8 connector. Now, between these two releases, the, there was an API change. So there needs to be a new connector to use uh, with Spark st streaming to connect to the Kafka.10 cluster. Now, in the documentation, there was a connector available, but the documentation wasn't updated when the connector was committed. So you actually had to dig into the code to figure out what these uh, differences in the API were. You had to investigate that stack trace that I showed you earlier and figure out that that API was no longer available in Kafka. And so now in the upstream guides, they have this nice little matrix that tell you what's supported in what language, what versions you should use, um, and also uh, what packages there are. So you can see that with the dot 10, it's experimental right now. Uh, it only supports Scala and Java, so there's no Python interface. If you're a Python user, you should use the Kafka dot 8. And uh, here, when you're looking at the streaming connector, 
there is a standard format. So keep this in mind. When you're looking for the connector, this middle section is the Kafka version, and the last part is the Scala version. So the two ones to keep the two versions to keep in mind are dot eight and dot ten for Kafka. For Scala, you're either using dot two dot eleven or two dot ten. So version compatibility is a very important thing to keep in mind when you're working with these systems. You can't just upgrade other systems. There's always a dependency between the two. This can be for streaming, even batch and using Spark against like a different high version and things like that. So version compatibility is a it's a very challenging problem in the space. Uh, two different components are upgrading, so always keep in mind to take a look at the upstream documentation, see if there are compatibility matrix out there, see what's supported before trying to upgrade your systems yourself. The next issue we'll dig into is this lovely stack trace that tells you this 2DF member uh, does not exist when you're using this RDD API. And typically, if you've done this in normal batch workloads where you're converting an RDD to a data frame with some schema, you typically call this API. And sometimes when you're trying to port this to a streaming system, you get this strange error. And so it says it's not a member of this class, but you know it actually is. So the solution here is that you need to import some implicit uh, classes. And here, the third line here tells you how to do that. And so for th these three lines of code, uh, this is the Spark session, sorry, Spark session API. The Spark Session API, which is about the same as the Spark context, and you want to import the SQL context implicit functions. And so this allows you to implicitly cast that RDD to a data frame. So the last line is the important one. Uh, it isn't clear why it's missing, but a lot of the examples and solutions online have this one line, but they don't explain why you need it. And so this is why. If you're looking and trying to piece together a bunch of examples, make sure you don't forget this line, because then you'll run into those problems. And the next one is a task not serializable. So this is an interesting one. Uh, with Spark, what we need to do is compile your code into a serialized object so that we can either checkpoint it and save that to a resilient storage. So that if the job were to fail, we can recover. We can figure out where we left off, what the code was that we were running, and uh, which offset we were at. And we also need that to allow the Spark application to send the job to all the workers. The uh, workers need to know what functions they need to run. Maybe they need to start a receiver and read from K Kafka or Kinesis. And so task not serializable means that you need to make sure that the object you're using is serializable. And so the solution for this is making sure that you have your Spark session uh, within your creating function of the Spark streaming application. And then you want to set the active session to that Spark session. And so here are a few uh, lines of code that we'd, we use to do that. The first line gets or creates that Spark session in the current environment. And then I set the, the S Spark context and SQL context, depending on what I want to use. The implicits from the previous uh, issue that we ran into is also there. And then we're also setting the active Spark session. So this should be inside the uh, streaming create functions uh, to get over this issue, because we want to be able to reference the Spark session uh, within your tasks. So another issue that some people have uh, asked me about, where pushing JSON records, and how do you efficiently do that to any of your K Kafka or Kinesis streams, right? You have an RDD, uh, maybe you transform it into a data frame, and then you eventually want to push it to JSON records uh, for some other downstream system to consume. And so you can actually do this with within Spark. There's built-in functions to go over the uh, RDD. You can convert it to a da data frame using uh, the APIs that I showed earlier. There's also a way to convert that data frame to a JSON string RDD, and then 
for that JSON RDD, you can push those records out to Kafka or Kinesis. So you don't need some Jackson library or something else and a bunch of complex APIs to do it and parse them yourself. You can actually use a lot of the built-in functions within Spark to do it for you. So I think the key here is that uh, when you're trying to build out these applications, looking at what's available within Spark and the upstream documentation and the data frames APIs to understand what we can leverage what's already there instead of having to reinvent the wheel. Right? So it's pretty common. You want to convert these records to JSON. It's a structured format. Data frames is very similar in the sense that it has structure on top of your data sets. And we can convert it very quickly into those records for you to push out into different systems. And a bonus uh, from those other issues is performance. A lot of people have asked us about performance. How, how do you make sure it's reliable? What if you start your streaming application after uh, it's been down a while? How do you make sure that the number of records that you're pushing into the system don't overwhelm your system? So there's a few things you can do here is to limit the rate that you want your streaming application to ingest the records. If you've done some performance tests, you want to know how many records you can safely process, and you want to cap that. You can look at the max rate per partition. So uh, partitions are spread across your executors, and you're consuming different partitions uh, across your Spark cluster. So you can enable that there. And then another one, if you don't want to tune with those specific flags, you can set uh, the back pressure enable to true, which means we're going to dynamically figure out what your cluster can handle. And then we'll rate limit it using some feedback control theory to uh, determine what the best rate is. So if the processing time and delay time starts increasing. We can restrict the number of records we're processing and then uh, be able to recover. And a lot of these are documented in the upstream guide that I've linked here. And uh, we'll send out the docs as well so that you can go into uh, all these. And I also will post some notebooks where I have these to read through like a Twitter stream, write it to S3, and you can all see this in a complete example. Cool. Uh, Thank you guys today uh, for joining my session today. And uh, if you have any other questions, I'll be uh, happy to answer them. All right. So, any questions? I I have one here, at the right, at the left for you. <laughs> um, for the structured uh, streaming. Um, is there already, already also their support for uh, if you have a if you're a managing state that you can do that also directly um, to a data frame or data set? Because now you need like this pair RDDs. Uh. Yeah. Uh, I'd actually have to take a look because there are you know a few things missing from structured streaming. But I could take a look and then we can talk at the the booth okay. later and I can okay. give you an answer for That's that one. Fine. Thank you. Um, so I have a question on uh, the problem of stragglers uh, in uh, streaming. So typically batches are executed one after the other, and uh, only one job can be executed at a time in uh, Spark streaming. Sure. And uh, it so happens uh, uh, that in many cases, one of the tasks is taking a long time within a single job. And uh, you know, in a 10 executor cluster, uh, 9 out of uh, 10 cl executors are idling, and only one is stuck processing it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can't even process the ones which are uh, scheduled on the driver. Uh, they're all just queued up on the driver, but they can't execute. Is there a way of solving this uh, problem? It's a good question. So is the straggler due to uh, it's data skew or something else, or is it like a bug within your application? Such it's that mostly to do with uh, uh, the outbound queries to external sources. Uh, you know, some of the Say, for example, MySQL. Uh, uh, one of the tasks talks to MySQL, and the query it fires for that particular data point is complex. So it takes time. Uh, but we're not, now we are not using uh, all the executors uh, most efficiently. Got it. Uh, so in, in that particular scenario, you would have to design it within your system. So you could use something like track state by key if it's taking over a certain amount of time, and typically it doesn't. Then maybe storing that record in the, the memory, 
and then trying to process it next. And then you can evict it, right? So basically, you're trying to just push it off. Uh, then you can have like a retry uh, or, or a threshold where you can say, all right, I've tried 10 times, and I can't complete it within this timeout, and it's screwing up everything else, right? Yep. Push it to another system, and then deal with it. So I think you, you have to think of that, that control logic, and you have to do it. Uh, you know, that's a pretty unique case to try to build it into the platform. Right. I think you'd have to do it yourself, like something like that. Okay. Thank you. Question. Yep. So uh, you mentioned um, there is limited support for um, sources and things for structured streaming. Yep. Is there a guide or somewhere or something like that that we uh, where we can? I mean, uh, that we could follow to make our own uh, connectors. Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. So you, if uh, structured streaming isn't going to come out fast enough with what you need, there, there are uh, sources and syncs that you can kind of uh, craft and create your own. Uh, I think there is like the socket stream. So you can kind of just pipe records and create your own into the socket stream. And I think structured streaming can support that. Uh, or you could base your own off, off those simple implementations and create your own. Uh, I think in terms of just as a community effort, uh, people can feel free to contribute their own. If, if you created one and you want to read from RabbitMQ, which is quite popular, then you know, feel free to contribute. Yeah. Um, basically, to check out the source to see how it is done and then... Yeah, so uh, you know, the, like, uh, the socket stream is a good one uh, that a lot of people look at to base their, their implementations on. I've had a, a few of my colleagues have done that. Uh, the file input stream, if you have something that's more, you want to dump a file into a particular location. I mean, there's some limitations on how those work today. Like, you have to dump into just one root bucket, but maybe you have subdirectories that you want to parse out. Like, you could write your own to do that. So uh, that's a great question. I can't say particularly in what release, but those are like the two most important. I know that we're working on the Kafka one right now. Uh, so in, in the next, uh, Paul, if, if I were to guess, it would be 2.1, something along the, uh, the, that release. Uh, so I have a question about, um, uh, zero downtime deployments for Spark mm -hmm. streaming applications. So uh, mm -hmm. I have a, a, a Spark streaming application that requires a certain amount of memory uh, to, to run. And so when you, do, when you want to deploy and have an old version of the app and um, a new version of the app, like